of if I think, oh no, no, I have said something of compromise of my scholarly identity or something. Um, okay, so I suggested that we do as uh, yesterday, um, we operate the systems of hands and fingers. So finger is uh, when uh, somebody would like uh, to follow up on the question or the comment of somebody else uh, and the finger clamps the hand uh, of somebody else and uh, therefore there must not be abuse uh, of uh, fingers uh, just as a way to jump the queue. I'm sure nobody is thinking of doing that but it happens uh, uh, in uh, other, other contests. So um, if you please use the chat uh, and write in the chat uh, just a Q for question of C for comment uh, or finger if you are following up from that because that will give me uh, the order in which uh, um, somebody has announced uh, a, a question or a, a comment. And as I said, I would propose that we, la we leave the last hour for metaphysical evil. Uh, which uh, is not much uh, given uh, the importance and pervasiveness of metaphysical evil. Okay, so uh, I have uh, Stefano who wants to ask a question and uh, Francesco had already verbally said that he wants to ask uh, a question Thanks. and then uh, Niccolò Fioravanti. So let's start with Stefano and then uh, um, Francesco and then uh, Nicolò. Maybe, maybe oh, and Daniel, uh, Daniel has, and uh, maybe before. Oh, Daniel, do you want to ask a question too? Uh, yes, if I can. Yes, uh, yes, I was uh, uh, not seeing I, you in the chat. Yeah, I, was quite, I was deciding. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's put you in, in the queue, and then you can uh, change your mind if you like. <laughs> okay, Stefano. Ah, Lorenzo, okay. Uh, so, thank you for this uh, outstanding uh, lecture. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I make a premise that uh, I, I think that actually uh, this is a case that this, of, of where I find uh, uh, convincing uh, um, uh, the presence of of a neoplatonic model, of a neoplatonic model. Uh, still, I have some, uh, some uh, um, so reflections uh, uh, I want to submit to you and to hear what you think about. Um, my impression is that uh, there is uh, maybe some tension in, uh, in Leibniz's uh, overall uh, um, stance of, of, of this, uh, on this issue. Uh, I mean, um, okay, uh, sure, he wants to, um, to emphasize that, uh, um, that uh, um, matter uh, should be uh, interpreted metaphysically, uh, ultimately, as a limitation. Uh, but um, my impression is that maybe in, in it depends also uh, a bit maybe on the context. Um, when uh, he, when uh, he, um, he he draws a met the metaphysical picture, uh, this is okay, and uh, especially in Theodician context, uh, I, I think it's, it's not accidentally all quotation, all clear quotation which you have uh, uh, used come uh, from. Uh, uh, context of theodicy, theodicy, uh, causa dei, uh, theodicy, or also the the remarks on twist. Right? Uh, so when when ultimately the problem is Leibniz has in view is the justification of evil uh, and, and so. Um, I, I I wonder whether in in uh, for, for instance when when he it deals with matter in uh, in context in dynamical context. No? Uh, the accent is a bit different. Uh, I think he emphasizes, he stresses the fact that uh, also these passive powers are something positive in 
contrast with, uh, for instance, with the explanation that which Cartesians and so on uh, were able to do to, to give uh, of uh, impenetrability, resistance, uh, and so on. And in general, I think that uh, uh, this ontology of power uh, of powers is uh, uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, there are no new new potential bare powers, no, uh, like the scholastics and so. Okay, you have said, uh, but uh, passive power are not the property power. See that I, I not I not persuaded of this uh, in, in dynamical context, and in general, I think that uh, when Leibniz would have uh, uh, answer to Scotus challenge, you know, when Scotus say, okay, if the, there is a composite, a composite cannot be built up from a few potentiality, uh, I think that Leibniz's answer could be, uh, I don't think that uh, there are pure potentialities. And this was exactly his uh, uh, main objection to the ontology of power of school men. So uh, I, I, I want to ask you if, if whether you, you think that there is some tension uh, in, in this uh, different context. Uh, okay, then another remark concerns uh, the, um, the idealistic interpretation, so to speak, that Leibniz ultimately is of this uh, of this matter, of prime, primary matter. Uh, you have hinted uh, a bit now on this. Uh, I, I think, I, I, I mean, uh, when he says that uh, primary matter uh, is uh, the, confu the confusion in, 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 uh, in perception. Huh? Uh, and this, of course, this uh, also matches well with your, with your reading, I think. Uh, although, there is also here a, a problem, not for you, but for Leibniz, maybe, you know, because uh, this, uh, uh, this confusion is also the only way uh, that we have to distinguish, uh, to distinguish uh, each uh, finite substance uh, from, from each other. It is practically, practically works as a, as a kind of individuation uh, principle, so something very, very important. I think. So these, these were my my two my two remarks. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much, Stefano. Let me um, note it down uh, because that's very interesting. Okay, so to the first thing, uh, um, whether there is a tension depending uh, on uh, the contests. Um, I think there is a difference uh, depending on the contest. Uh, I wouldn't uh, call it uh, um, a tension if, uh, um, if uh, what is meant by tension uh, is uh, the sort of uh, interpretative reading of Leibniz that Leibniz is more than one metaphysics uh, and uh, depending on the context, uh, one metaphysics uh, is operating or the other one is operating and there is uh, no uh, real uh, uh, coherent uh, system there. I, I, I myself don't agree with that interpretation. I certainly um, uh, consider that uh, there are different phases, uh, different uh, development uh, in Leibniz, uh, and there are tests uh, in which it seems to be going in different uh, direction and, and maybe in some tests uh, it, it does uh, go in different uh, direction over 70 years uh, who can uh, always say something uh, completely coherent uh, well give him a break uh, if it was uh, a rainy afternoon in an offer and he was just uh, trying to think well how would it be if we think that way what, what we are looking at uh, is uh, the considered view of Leibniz and uh, as the considered view of Leibniz. I think you are right that there, is, uh, there are important differences in the way in which he speaks of these things in a Theodicean context or in the dynamic, dynamic contest. 
The way I read uh, this uh, um, difference in his considered view is the following. When he's talking about a creatorial limitation uh, uh, in the theodic and uh, concept uh, in the theodic and uh, contest, uh, he is uh, um, really going down to the deep ontology. That is to say, is a talking uh, of primary primitive uh, uh, powers. Is going down uh, to really is deeper. Uh, ontology, of which the forces which we experience and can measure and all that in the physical world and of which, with which the dynamic deals are manifestations. As manifestations, they are grounded in this deeper ontology, but as manifestations, they will have their own, their own features. But they are also them phenomena bene fundata. That is to say, they are the way in which in the physical world, which is a, a world of phenomena, this uh, deeper ontology is uh, manifested. And uh, when it is uh, with that, uh, then uh, yes, uh, here I think uh, you have uh, these derivative forces, uh, which uh, like extension, like bodies, uh, they do all sorts of things and they, they, they have uh, to, in that context, uh, their own active uh, uh, operations, uh, and they do things, uh, they, they cause things to happen and so on, as extension, uh, as uh, bodies, uh, and, and all that. But the way in which I read it is the like Leibniz says, uh, yes, uh, this is all, all fine, uh, uh, but remember, these are derivative forces, these are uh, the manifestation uh, of something else. And although we are correct in that context when we are describing phenomena to regard them as proper forces and so on, uh, deep down uh, what is happening is explained uh, by primitive passive uh, forces, which is uh, a limited, what is it is uh, the, the manifestation of extension, the manifestation of this inertia and so on, are manifestation of this limitation of creatures which ontologically, formally, is, uh, is non-being. So th that is the way in which I, I um, read this uh, relationship. And uh, you are right to say that in those uh, physical contexts, uh, th these are proper forces in, in, uh, in, in many ways. And the second thing about uh, uh, the uh, confusion uh, and uh, these uh, the uh, the confusion in perceptions uh, are working as a principle of individuation. Uh, I agree that that is what is happening, but again, uh, there is, uh, as you were already pointing out, uh, a way to read that which is consistent with the picture I was uh, giving, because uh, what what, I, what is this uh, ontologically? What is uh, this uh, confusion is the lack of distinctiveness, uh, is that you don't get all the distinctions that there, 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 are, there are there. You, if we think of the distinction between clear and distinct, something could be clear without being distinct. And being clear means that there is some degree of confusion, which is simply that you don't get all the distinctions which are, which are there. So it seems to me that, yes, it acts as a principle of individuation, but again, it's not something positive as it were, is that uh, uh, is the, these are the different degrees of perfection. What is there ontologically positive uh, is a perfection uh, which comes uh, in different degrees. So that is how, how I read that. And yes, you are right that that is uh, what serves as a, a principle of individuation. Is that uh, okay? Um, may I pass on to the next question? I think uh, um, uh, Francesco uh, announced himself at the very beginning. Uh. 
<laughs> yes, uh, I will be short, so uh, there will be time even for Daniel. Um, my uh, question is uh, very easy. Uh, I fully ag agree with you that Leibniz's uh, 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 concept of the disposition is not the traditional one, and uh, uh, it is a, a nice uh, um, uh, remark b by you, and uh, I, I uh, share with you the opinion that the metaphysics of dispositions is a crucial point of Leibniz's uh, uh, approach, uh, especially in last uh, in last years. But uh, my question is, um, I, I I find that it is it would be even. Uh, um, uh, a danger to t transform uh, these positions in uh, purely logical uh, uh, concepts. Uh, in my opinion, Leibniz sees these positions, even passive dispositions, as uh, something uh, that in some sense is physical, uh, is causal. <laughs> uh, uh, if uh, it is not so, there are a lot of passages of Leibniz uh, who have no sense more. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, resistance, uh, uh, the, the analogy between uh, 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 sin and the resistance of the matter. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of passages in which Leibniz uh, employs the analogy between the passive dispositions of the monads uh, and uh, and uh, uh, mat uh, material cause, causality, uh, Aristotelian material causality. And uh, I suppose that uh, this uh, mm, uh, assumption has, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, an importance for uh, his theory of sin. <laughs> and, uh, it would be um, uh, a a danger to transform uh, uh, these positions in the, uh, something purely logical or metaphysical because uh, we don't understand uh, what uh, precisely do uh, uh, created substances uh, uh, when they uh, have an imperfect action, they are imperfect and so, and so on. So uh, this is my question. Um, uh, do you think that Leibniz has a completely uh, logical view of dispositions uh, and uh, uh, passive power is just metaphorical or th is there some physical sense, more concrete sense of the uh, passive dispositions of uh, uh, the primary internal primary matter of morals. Okay, um, I don't think that the dispositions are purely logical in Leibniz or in general. Uh, the, to the other broader question, I would uh, reply in the same way in which I was replying uh, to Stefano. And that is to say that one thing is uh, the deeper metaphysics uh, and another one uh, is uh, the derivative forces, the forces uh, which we study in uh, physics, uh, which can be measured and so on. And they have their own as phenomena. They have phenomenal forces as well. They have their, their own features. I do um, certainly think that there is a, a, a role for dispositions also there in the physical world. And indeed, the example I was giving uh, um, of the disposition of a glass to break uh, mm. and uh, all that is, is uh, an example from the physical world. What I was getting at um, was a more general metaphysical point uh, that it seems to me is important to um, point out that not all dispositions are powers, not mm -hmm. all dispositions are properly uh, analyzed, if you like, as abilities. Seems to me mm -hmm. that certain dispositions should be analyzed as liabilities, and that makes a, a, a big difference. And all that without entering into Leibniz, without um, uh, going into the deeper metaphysics simply uh, as a, a way to explain uh, the, the physical world. Uh, so I certainly um, think that there is, a, a, in Leibniz, uh, a, a, a use and a 
a, a very important place to put these positions, uh, powers uh, in uh, the physical world. And the relationship I see with uh, the uh, metaphysics is the one I was uh, suggesting, uh, replying to, to Stefano. Okay, I have here um, Niccolò Fioravanti. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for your lecture. That was really interesting. And I have a question on the, the Boulder uh, cited text, because I think there is a kind of uh, dialectic in a Hegelian sense between the first point and the last point of uh, the, the Boulder quotation. I mean, the, the Leibniz quotation in, uh, in the letter to the Boulder, insofar as uh, um, basically um, Leibniz uh, claims for what concerns uh, monads, as in the first point, a monist account for uh, um, the modern matter and form that even if it's not strictly Aristotelian, um, a strictly Aristotelian model, but is um, it is a uh, insofar as we conceive of uh, substances as um, kind of gist of force that keeps together a primary active force and a um, and a primary passive force as only one uh, one principle. There's a uh, there's a monist account. While in the last point we have the animal or uh, the corporeal substance, which is explained according to a um, pluralist account of uh, concerning forms, and the animal is unified. I mean, both are unum per se, but the animal is unified as a, uh, is functionally unified. It's something that is one over time, but actually the the body of an animal it's like the Theseus sheep or uh, or a river that. Um, whose parts can be exchanged. So uh, I think that these two points are together. I mean, the let's say the third moment, it's the the, 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 the conception of the organism, basically. If one uh, conceives of the organism as an entity, there are also position uh, that, that claim that is not an entity. And then there's another, um, I mean, not an entity, not, not a thing in, in Leibniz uh, philosophy. Uh, and the other question is uh, whether actually primary matter is something that arises from uh, composibility of substances in a in a, um, in a given possible world and then in, a, in the actual world from coexistence. So it's something that um, it is the way to in, insert plurality um, in Leibniz system that if not would collapse in something like Spinoza's uh, vision of substance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, can you repeat? So what uh, what was at the end of your first part? So what is the question at the end of your first part? I didn't I didn't catch that. Whether there is a kind of dialectic between um, monist conception of, uh, of uh, forms, basically on the level of monads, uh, and then um, with the the other, uh, the other pole that is the corporeal substance in which there is a pluralism of forms. Yeah. And also because Leibniz uh, often, I mean, almost always claims that the, the simple substances are always with their bodies, that even yeah. when they... I, I, I understand, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, first of all, I have to come uh, clean here as it were. Uh, obviously, there is a debate uh, in uh, the Leibniz world uh, of whether in Leibniz uh, there are uh, corporeal substances uh, in the strict sense in which he takes uh, a substance uh, that is uh, with uh, being unum per se. And I am uh, one of those people uh, uh, taking the view that uh, in a strict sense, uh, corporeal substances are not substances because uh, the degree of unity they have is not uh, sufficient for that. So uh, in that debate, uh, that is uh, where uh, I place uh, I place myself. And in this uh, sense, uh, there is a dialectic uh, here uh, between uh, the monads, uh, which is uh, the substances in the strict, uh, strong sense of the term, uh, and uh, a looser sense of the term in which uh, Leibniz uh, um, speaks uh, of the animal or corporeal substance, uh, which, uh, as you rightly um, say, is uh, 
something which is composed uh, of a plurality of uh, substances, each one uh, with its own uh, form, uh, which is the entelechy, which is the um, primitive uh, passive form. So yes, I, I think there, uh, um, there is a dialectic. Uh, I take the view that uh, um, the animal uh, or corporeal substance uh, does not have uh, the, the strict enough uh, kind of uh, unity, which is uh, required uh, to be, in a strict sense, uh, a, a Leibnizian substance. Of course, we can uh, we can uh, speak of substances in a in a loose broader sense. Leibniz does it all the time, including in this passage. But that is uh, where I I sit in that uh, debate much broader than uh, than uh, what I do and uh, what I have specifically done uh, done uh, on it. Um, the Second question was, uh, sorry, remind me. Uh, the second question was um, whether um, primary passive or primary matter um, arises as something um, due yeah, to for the plurality. Yeah, composibility yeah. and coexistence. Um, I am myself, I am not sure, and I would be interested to hear what uh, other people, including yourself, uh, think. Um, because I think the notion of uh, composibility is really a logical uh, notion, uh, and uh, uh, it has to do with uh, concept, uh, that is to say, with uh, possibility, logical possibility in the mind, uh, in the mind of God. And uh, when Leibniz uh, is uh, speaking of uh, um, primary matter is really using is a metaphysical register, as it were, uh, uh, rather than uh, its logical. Uh, uh, logical, logical register. I am not uh, saying that uh, these are two incompatible uh, things, but uh, it, it seems to me that uh, these are two different uh, approaches. And uh, when we uh, speak of uh, Composibility is uh, is this uh, logical notion. Having said that, I think it is consistent uh, with the thinking of uh, primary matter as uh, what uh, in a, in a metaphysical, uh, as it were, register is uh, determining uh, what is composible with uh, other other substances, uh, provided uh, that we don't. Uh, we don't verify primary matter because, uh, um, as I was replying to uh, Stefano at the beginning, the, also the confusion of perceptions uh, as the principle of individuation uh, should not be uh, verified. Uh, it is, uh, and at the same time, uh, primary matter as uh, what determines the individuality of. Uh, substances which are composible, uh, in my view, uh, one has to be careful not, uh, not to uh, verify it uh, as if it were some, something positively um, determining uh, their uh, individuality. W what we have uh, is uh, different uh, degrees uh, of per perfection, uh, or different degrees of perception, a distinctiveness in perception, uh, which uh, are, uh, can be described uh, in terms of very different uh, limitations, uh, different uh, um, primary, different uh, uh, different versions of primary matter. At least uh, that is I, uh, how I would uh, uh, look at it. I don't know whether you agree or you had in mind a different. Uh, yeah, I had in mind a um, slightly different idea that is um, basically if we conceive of uh, substances, I mean individual substances, as um, an instantiated law, namely the law of the organism. Or, or for example, in the um, correspondence with the world, uh, there's, um, there's a certain insistence of Leibniz um, in um, likening the, the um, primitive forces to uh, a law of a series. And if we conceive of substances as something that is the instance of a law, in the sense that 
It is um, something that implies a series of states that are perceptions. In that sense, uh, primary matter, even if it's not reified, it is something that implies uh, uh, the having a body, let's say, the way in which uh, a given substance relates to all the other substances over time at each instant with a different configuration of, of dominated uh, substances. Then there's the next step, that is the realization of this law in towards physical, uh, in the physical world, basically. And in the physical world, we talk about derivative forces. And according to derivative forces, we have then uh, secondary matter that is actually a mixer. It's not only um, it's not only a, a, a derivation of primary of primary matter. It's something that comes also from active force because it involves the active forces of, uh, for example, the, the subordinated monads or monads that uh, in some. Of course, there's not uh, influx between. Uh, there's not direct influence between different monads. But anyways, um, the world contained within a substance in the states of the substance represents. I mean. There is at least there is a, a relation of expression between um, the content of the different uh, substances, and in that sense, I I think that we can say that primary matter arises from composability in the sense that God arranges different uh, sets of law individual laws that are composable. Of course, if not, uh, if there were pure activity, it, it would kind of uh, repeat himself that, that that's that's um, crazy in the uh, in Leibniz view um, and so we have compossible uh, laws that interact with each other and that in the actual world are coexistent individuals and then we have the problem of secondary matter yeah I, I am a, I am okay with all that as long as uh, there is no verification of primary matter uh, so all that you said, it seems to me, could also be explained in terms of composability as a composability of different degrees of perception, uh, of perfection, uh, which is uh, pointing the spotlight uh, on uh, the limited uh, um, primitive active force rather than uh, on uh, uh, primary matter. But if you like, we are talking of the same, uh, the same thing. Uh, as long as it is not verified, uh, that's that's fine with me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. That was a, a, a well, a very interesting uh, for me. Let me sorry, note that down. Okay, so we have now Arno. Okay, you know everything about this already. I hope I didn't bore you to death. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Marosa. I really enjoyed your presentation, and th yeah, that's that's stuff that I really like. And um, I, I basically agree with everything because um, deep down, as you say, we are only talking about aspects of things that are not ontological separate elements, and I think we all agree on this. So that's only ways of speaking. And nevertheless, you, you said something, and, and I struggle with one thing, which is um, you said that passive powers, so primitive passive powers, are not genuine powers, and that only active powers are the real genuine powers. Um, and I struggle a little bit with this because um, you are right to you are right in the sense that everything. Uh, that is in a monad or produced by a monad is produced by itself. That's the spontaneity th thesis. So everything is actively, so to speak, and that's one concept of action, is actively produced by the monad. But then there are different states so and different kinds of repetitions. So some of them uh, go to lesser distinct um, perceptions, and these are called... Uh, uh, passions for uh, Leibniz, and others are um, or tend to more distinct perception, and they, these are called actions. So it seems to me, nevertheless, that you have two. So everything is produced actively, actively by, and that's one concept of action. But within this one concept of action, you have 
another distinction between action and passions. And you have a petition, a petitions going to a petitions which lead to passions and the petitions which uh, lead yeah. to actions. Right. And so that's what um, with which I, I struggle here because I would not say that uh, passive powers does not nothing. It does something. It does something. It produces. So the entelech it produces a lesser distinct state. It does something for me. So that's that's my concern. Mm. Okay, well, uh, this is, uh, I, I see the concern, uh, but uh, it, it seems to me that one cannot, uh, um, in a sense, have it both ways. Either these uh, passive, uh, um, primitive passive powers are uh, uh, something which actively do something or not. And it seems to me that if they act actively do something, they have got to be some kind of active power. Uh, so that, that is my first, the, first uh, uh, remark there. The sort of thing that you were uh, um, describing, uh, I, I agree with all of that, but it seems to me that it can be uh, re-described in a way which just uh, uses uh, in the deep uh, ontology, the uh, limited active power in explaining uh, these uh, different uh, degrees uh, of uh, perception, different degrees uh, of uh, distinctiveness. So I agree with all uh, that uh, you say, and there is a uh, after a function as a way, so to speak, uh, a, a way in which uh, the so-called uh, passive uh, power does uh, something, but I would describe the that in terms of not of uh, the power causing something, uh, actively causing something, but uh, as being uh, the reason uh, why we have uh, different degrees uh, of distinctiveness. The reason uh, of that uh, is uh, that uh, the active powers uh, have uh, different uh, limitations. So with my example of uh, a race, uh, it seems to me then that when people are, are uh, racing and here the race is uh, to who has uh, the most uh, distinct uh, perception, uh, uh, the people will come uh, at different, uh, a different point of this uh, distinction uh, because uh, some uh, have uh, a, a, a more uh, um, perfect uh, power, uh, active power of running of a certain speed, uh, and others uh, have a more limited uh, power to run uh, of a certain speed. It seems to me that the only power which is uh, involved here is uh, this uh, active power to do certain things, uh, to go at a certain speed, uh, and that uh, is the reason uh, why somebody <laughs> comes to the more distinct perception uh, and somebody is uh, uh, comes to the uh, less distinct uh, perception. So, um, in a sense, if we think uh, of that uh, in terms of, uh, say, intelligence, uh, there are uh, people uh, who are more acute than other people, let's say, Leibniz, for instance, are definitely vastly more acute than uh, I am. He sees uh, all sorts of things, uh, distinctions, which I, I cannot see. But uh, what is there uh, is just uh, that we have uh, intelligence, uh, some is more powerful, uh, some more perfect, uh, and uh, some is less. So, so it's not uh, that in me there is another force, which is stupidity, which <laughs> comes on top of my intelligence and prevents me from seeing things. It's like, uh, if you like, uh, sight. Uh, it's not that I, I, I am very myopic, uh, it, what that is, is that, that my sight uh, is lacking uh, something. Uh, it's not that there is uh, some uh, other positive thing on top, uh, on top of it, and that is why I, I cannot see distinctly, distinctly in, uh, in the distance, uh, for instance. So it seems to me that uh, this is what is uh, going on uh, deep down in, in the deep uh, metaphysics. So I, I agree with you that uh, this passivity has a key role to play, 
huge role to play. It explains a lot of things, uh, but it explains it uh, as a reason uh, rather than as a cause. And it seems to me that powers uh, um, need to have, to be proper powers, uh, and need to have this sort of causal power rather um, than, uh, as in this case, of being the reason uh, of uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, less distinct perceptions uh, and so on. That at least, uh, at least uh, uh, my, my, my proposal, which uh, as it were uh, runs uh, right on top of a certain uh, general metaphysics of powers uh, uh, that might not be accepted by, by, by everybody. Anyway, thank you very much for that. I have a finger here from uh, uh, Richard, Richard Davids. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think that when I heard you first talk about these passive powers, um, I, I had in mind uh, at, at a very low level, uh, for instance, the notion of inertia. Uh, when uh, Leibniz criticizes uh, Descartes' notion of motion. He says, no, 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 it can't be motion that we're measuring, but um, uh, some sort of power of movement. And against, and against that power of movement, there'll be the power of not movement, which would be inertia. And I didn't know whether that was a sort of uh, passive yeah, power. Well, uh, I as I said, the inertia uh, Leibniz is talking here is a uh, Keplerian um, inertia that is a resistance mm. uh, to movement. Yeah, that, that, that was that was my, my understanding of what, what you were going for, and that yeah, um, yeah. there might be higher levels of that, but that's the, the, the bottom level of a, of, a, of a passive power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least that is the manifestation uh, in the physical world. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, That's... and uh, well, to me it was especially significant when Leibniz says uh, uh, in the Theodicy, otherwise that would be acting. So this is not acting. What is acting is the current, uh, this, uh, this force bringing the boat, uh, and uh, um, the they both are just uh, not receptive uh, enough of that. They are not acting uh, themselves. That is what I was uh, pointing at. Thank you. Uh, OK, do we have uh, other questions uh, or uh, comments, fingers? I think, ah, Dan, Dan, sorry. I was hey, not Dan. <laughs> because he was not in the in the chat, sorry. No, thank yes. you. I, I uh, want to first thank you for your very enjoyable lectures. I must say, this is an area of liveness that has never really interested me that much. And I guess being stuck at home, it's nice to have lectures which have explained it to me very, very well. And my question probably is very trivial. I'm curious to know, you present these, your theory today uh, as present by 1695 or in the mature Leibniz. It, it it didn't spring full blown from his head. Is that a fair time to say? And then I would wonder whether, uh, obviously, in terms of of the phenomena, well founded phenomena, your discussion is not really that relevant because you can always. But is the is the notion of pre established harmony? It, it seems to be essential. And does that is that about this? developed the same time. It seems to me they're both around 1695, 1696. Am I correct? Is that just a coincidence or do you think he saw that he need better have that as well as a theory? Otherwise, uh, some other areas are not going to work at all. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it is. Uh, it is by chance that uh, this uh, uh, theory appears uh, in the same, uh, roughly in the same period in the mature Mm -hmm. Mature Leibniz, uh, and uh, also the ontology of forces uh, is uh, a, a mature development, if you like, uh, around the time uh, Leibniz is doing the dynamica. So here there is a, a really after uh, his trip to Italy and uh, around this uh, 
1694, 1695, there is really a cluster of things which comes together for Leibniz. Myself, I don't read that as a change of direction on Leibniz doing something before. I read it as Leibniz finally having been thinking about these things in various ways, find his own distinctive way to really capture what he was had been trying to say in its uh, key, uh, or if you like, in its um, deeper direction uh, all along, uh, these, uh, these ideas of unity and activity uh, and so on. So yes, I think uh, that it, it is not by chance uh, that uh, this is a period of grace for Leibniz in which uh, a lot of things uh, around uh, 1695 uh, come together among us, uh, simple substances, uh, um, they uh, pre-establish harmony and these developments in the um, ontology of force uh, in the dynamica. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, uh, reached a, a good point, uh, um, which is uh, 1025 uh, uh, here, over here, 11.25 over there. And uh, I suggest that uh, we take uh, a, a good five minute break. And yes. uh, when uh, we reconvene, or if you like even 10, whatever you like, there is a 10 more suitable for a cup of coffee. You, you tell me. Well, let's do five uh, and then uh, we can uh, slowly Slowly. Five, five. <laughs> five, five. five. Otherwise, okay. uh, it will okay. become a 15. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, do five and uh, we will reconvene with the metaphysical evil. I will uh, introduce it. Uh, I, I don't think uh, we can uh, go very far uh, in uh, the discussion, but there is tomorrow to do that. So, as a way to intense you to come also tomorrow. See you in five minutes.